This conference will now be recorded. Hello and welcome everyone. I would like to welcome all of you uh, who are attending today and let's have a quick um, you know, discussion of the most important Duke article uh, question. It's SPA questions, of course. Um, you will find that I focus on the recent Tug articles, okay, in the in the SPA. However, we recommend for anybody who are appearing the exam that you revise the last three years, last three to five years, okay, of the Tug articles before you appear in your exam. But also there is all but gold Tug articles. Tug articles comes from 2014, maybe before that maybe 2015 or 16 still some took articles are very important uh, the easy thing about it that you can um, you know find in the recall the repeated questions from the previous took article so you understand which took article of clinical significance uh, in the exam or from the exam point of view recent took articles nobody actually can predict which topics can come but we always find if there is a hot topic okay comes in the two articles that will take a priority right so like for example if you have a two article postmenopausal bleeding that will take a, a priority a two articles that have uh, some uh, obstetric emergency that will take a priority like that okay so um here okay uh, is the collection so i will start to review the questions with you guys uh, you will be required to post your answer in the chat box okay and i'm going to comment uh, on the correct answer and explain it okay will that be okay with you okay so let's start our first question and our first question here says that we have a 35 year old woman she is 34 weeks pregnant she's admitted with left flank pain pyrexia and hypotension there is blood protein and nitrate in her urine. She is started on gentamicin and coamoxiclav for treatment of sepsis due to left bilunephritis. What fluid resuscitation regimen would you describe for her? So what do you think, guys? Is it Hartman's? Is it albumin? Is it 5% dextrose? Colloid? Gelfugin? Or saline? Okay, so well done i can see most of you have got the right answer it's the hartman yes so what is the rate the rate is also important please take care of the rate it comes from the took article on recent um, update in sepsis right uh, it's i think it was 2020 took article so the hartman is by the rate of 20 per kg per hour okay why we will not give more than that simply because you would like to outweigh the risk of volume overload again it's the risk of dehydration and kidney injury right so this is the one this is the correct rate and this is the correct solution well done In our next question, we have 75-year-old woman admitted for induction of labor at term following a spontaneous rupture of membrane 48 hours earlier. She feels generally unwell with abdominal pain and green vaginal discharge. Her pulse is 110 beats per minute with blood pressure of 90 over 55 and temperature of 38.3. She is started on high flow oxygen, IV fluids, IV broad spectrum antibiotic she's catheterized and the blood, blood blood culture have been taken what is the most appropriate next investigation to aid hair management so you will remember the sepsis x bundle right and the most important investigation now will be the lactate level right and you all uh, know that the severe sepsis diagnosis uh, we start from the two level and the septic shock from four, right? Do you remember that? It's lactate. Okay. Yes. Well, well done. Which fetal tissue is the most susceptible to thermal injury from imaging in utero? This is comes from the took article of imaging in pregnancy.
that's everybody agree for eight yes well done it's the brain yes okay so i would like you to revise some hints from this article okay some key uh you know key points for you guys to uh, remember this is about the appropriate use of imaging in pregnancy um so of course if there is any acute uh, or life threatening condition actually we will perform the image no matter what however the level of uh, the geological effect okay it's very important okay that there is available evidence to demonstrate that the effect of diagnostic imaging studies on the fetus involving less than mgy radiation at any 50 mgy radiation at any gestation are likely to be neglectful so here in this table that comes from the took article also that table show guys what is the level of radiation okay the fetal radiation dose and we are going to use the unit mgy right so if you look here my dear friend that there is very low dose examinations like cervical spinal x-ray chest x-ray radiography of extremities okay and mammography and head and neck ct low to moderate dose like abdominal x-ray lumbar spine x-ray ct chest or angio limited ct pelvimetry low dose perfusion okay and pulmonary digital subtraction angiography high dose examination like the abdominal ct or pelvic ct or whole body pet scan okay guys so those are the high risk however there is advice my dear friend that use of shielding technique significantly will reduce the dose of ionizing radiation to that to which the fetus is exposed remember that mri is remain preferable to studies using ionizing radiation in pregnancy because it's safe and there is theoretical concern regarding the magnetic reson resonance image in pregnancy and this is have not been supported actually in human studies so far it's safe how about use of contrast material during pregnancy do you agree on that or do you think that is something that should be avoided unless the risk uh, is outweighed by the, the by the benefit what do you think we will avoid it unless it's something life-threatening right so when only the benefit outweigh the risk okay then we go for the contrast in pregnancy right from the tissue that can be affected by radiation exposure to radiation in pregnancy central nervous system is the most susceptible tissue to thermal injury okay guys okay other problem that came in the animal studies like uh, neural tube defect uh, disorder of muscle tone miscarriage fetal growth restriction okay so this was a quick review about the information here and it will be a source of single best answer question in your exam 28 year old woman nine weeks of gestation following ivf treatment she had been admitted with severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and vaginal spotting her past medical history include polycystic ovary pre early miscarriages and hypothyroidism her TSH level is currently 1.8 and transvaginal ultrasound confirm a viable pregnancy. She is given intravenous crystalloid and analgesia. What additional treatment is indicated here? From her history, guys, what is the very significant point that we need here? Progesterone will be mostly very useful, okay? At the luteal phase support until the placenta takes over, right? So the most significant here is the three early miscarriages. What is this problem in the lady?
this problem in the lady she had a recurrent pregnancy loss right okay plus what is her risk of complication because she is having also iv treatment She had OHSS, okay? So want to save her life now or you want to give her progesterone to support the nine weeks or levo thyroxine because the TSH is 1.8. Yes, low molecular weight he heparin, please. She had OHSS, okay? Thank you, thank you very much. It's low molecular weight heparin. Guys, the case is full of distractors, okay? However, safety first, right? So always remember that, that safety is first. Sometimes in the exam, you will find some cases like this and you will be distracted. Oh, is it the problem in the TSH? Maybe this is recurrent miscarriage because of hypothyroidism, or this is because IVF pregnancy, I will give her progesterone or I will give progesterone because she lost babies before. And you forgot that the lady is admitted because severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, right? So please take care, safety things first, okay? Don't be trapped. A 50 year old woman is on dabigatran for embolic stroke. Okay, so that's mean she, in long-term anticoagulant, right? Oral anticoagulant. She is, uh, requires emergency surgery now for ovarian cyst accident. What can, be, what can the effect of her anticoagulants, uh, or how, sorry, can the effect of her anticoagulant be reversed? Anything? Yes, it's antidote to the dabigatran. It's the idaru map. Yes, excellent. Okay. You will notice that some of the questions already appeared in the list in the recent exams. Okay, because as I told you, we focus on the previous or the past three years. Okay, so as you can see, the importance of the question that it can appear in the exam. If you are an examiner and you want to put new question in any exam. What will be your sources? Your sources will be the recent updates, right? Either from the guidelines, of course, which is the top priority, or comes from the TUG articles, right? Because this will be the second source that the college will depend on after guidelines. Okay, so any updates, please guys study it carefully for your exam. We have a 40 year old woman had a normal delivery three days ago. She presented to the emergency department with sudden onset this phase. Okay, please take care. Okay, right sided dropping of face and right arm weakness. What is this problem in this lady? What do you think that she have now? Stroke, yes. Blood pressure is 150 over 100 and pulse is 65 per minute. What is the most appropriate First line investigation. First line investigation in cases of emergencies is CT. Okay, so which type of CT here? We have CT perfusion scan, CT angiogram, CT with no contrast. Yes, the non contrast CT. So the aim here will be that you're trying to find the difference between the embolic and the hemorrhagic stroke, right? Is it clear, guys? A 40-year-old admitted at 35 weeks with severe headache and dysphagia again. Emergic confirms the diagnosis of cerebral venous thrombosis. So now by image, we have a clear diagnosis that this is embolic, okay, or thrombotic event 
and this is a cerebral vein thrombosis. So what will be the optimal treatment for this lady? Okay, so dear friend, if you have the option between the IV heparin or the low molecular weight heparin, which one you will go for? Just to make sure that you are excellent and you're clear in concepts. Yes, well done. Yes, my champions here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm so happy, guys, that you got it right. Yes, she is 35 weeks of gestation, right? So if she is 35 weeks of gestation, that's near to delivery. So we will not give low molecular weight heparin because we can't control bleeding if she suddenly came into labor or any event. But IV uh, heparin will be much adjustable, right? IV heparin antidote is... Protamine sulfate. Yes, well done. Well done. Okay. In a 21-year-old, she's primary with medical history of thyroid disease. Currently, she is 27 weeks of pregnancy and attend her optician complaining of blurred vision. She's otherwise well. Examination reveals myopia. Okay. This is short sightedness. What is the likely cause of this? Okay, so it is two things. Okay, one is the two answers I can see is water retention or macular edema. Okay, so what do you think, guys, is the more physiological event? Most likely it will be. It's water retention, okay? And it's problem in the eyesightness, right? It's a problem in the, mainly in the lens, right? Does this make any sense to you? Okay, so guys, let's have a quick review for this article and some facts, okay? That we'd like to, you know, revise together. Okay, so in this article, as you can see, this is regarding the ocular manifestation and I'm using the infographic of the RCUG okay which is uh, freely available for everyone so the complex physiological transformation of pregnancy can cause some changes to the eye and vision this is the fact right okay some of these problem can be physiological due to physiological changes some of these can be due to pathological problem right Okay, so in this infographic, my friends, we will outline some examples of the physiological and pathological change that can occur during pregnancy. Okay, so what happened during pregnancy? During pregnancy, we have a change on hormonal profile, blood circulation, metabolism, plasma expansion, salt and water retention, right? So all of this change in the whole body affect the eye because simply eye is part of the body, right? Okay, so we see during pregnancy some ocular change that may occur as a result of this. Also, most are temporary and rarely become a problem in the long term. Pregnant women may be concerned about the effect of pregnancy on their pre-existing ocular condition, if any, or the use of ocular drugs during pregnancy. 
So we will find that some conditions might affect the tissue surrounding the eye. Tissue surrounding the eye. Okay? And these will most likely reverse after delivery. Like what? Like, for example, ptosis. Okay? This is uncommon. Ptosis, which is the dropping of eyelid, may occur due to hormonal change or fluid retention. It's usually mild and often unilateral. Okay? So if you have a question like the previous one in the exam and ask you about ptosis, okay? And he asks you, Dear friends, about what is the cause of that? Is that something pathological, permanent in the eye, or something physiological more likely to reverse after delivery? It's physiological due to the fluid retention, and it's more likely that it will reverse after delivery. Rarely, if ptosis is a combined by pupil abnormality and or double vision, then in this case, this will prompt urgent ophthalmic assessment and the neuroimaging are required. So in exam, you have a question about ptosis only. This is physiological and it will be, you know, reassuring the patient that this is what reverse after delivery. But the combination of ptosis plus double vision, okay, or pupil abnormality, that's mean It's something in the nerves. It could be a nerve, ocular nerve palsy or something, right? So, or it can be something in the brain. So I need urgent ophthalmic assessment and neuroimaging required. Is it clear so far? Okay. What about the melasma? Okay. Melasma is mask of pregnancy. This is area of facial skin, Hyper, hyperpigmentation, which affects 75% of the women in the second half of pregnancy. And again, it's reversible. Okay, then, so from the tissue around the, surrounding the eye, we will go to the front of the eye, okay? The changes that affect the front of the eye are most, you know, innocent, and it can be provided uh, by the optimist, okay? So, like what? Changes of cornea and lens. Look, my dear friends, first line here says what? In changes of cornea and lens, that fluid retention may increase the thickness of the cornea and lens up to how many percent? 30%, okay? There is 14% of pregnant women experience increased myopia. Okay, so it comes a question, okay, about the ocular manifestation comes from the infographic directly. Okay, so the cause is fluid retention. So let's have, you know, some more about the changes in the front of the eye. Eye pressure. What do you think about the eye pressure increase or decrease? Decrease, drop by two to three millimeter mercury, okay? So this is thought to be associated with a change in the progesterone level, okay? Okay, guys, so eye pressure drop due to it change in the progesterone level, not urine retain, not fluid retention here. Intraocular pressure often drop by two to three and require no treatment. Pregnant women with pre-existing glaucoma or ocular hypertension may benefit from the physiological changes. Right? So this is a good news for patient with glaucoma. Tear film. What about the tear film? Is the tear film even a change? Yes, it cannot change. How? Hormonal change can cause dry eye symptoms. Okay, so a common that we see dry eye in pregnancy? Yes, it's common. So this can be treated or relieved by lubricant eye drops. Easy so far? So problem in the anterior or front of the eye? It's so far 
not very harmful, okay? So conditions affecting the back of the eye. A back of the eye is dangerous, okay, guys? Where the back of the eye lie? Back of the eye is part of from which organ in our body? Which place in our body? We find the retina in the posterior chamber, yes. Yeah. Now it's in the brain, right? Okay, so this area is very sensitive, okay? So if there is a change or affection of the back of the eyes, this will be usually pathological, okay? And there was one question before about this, about which one is more dangerous. It's the pathological in the posterior. Remember, P was P, okay? So diabetic retinopathy. Diabetic retinopathy involves damage to the retinal vasculature, right? It's a problem in the vascular. So one 10 to 20% of diabetic women with little or no retinopathy at the start of pregnancy may experience mild progression. But in women with more significant retinopathy, progression may be seen in up to 55% of patients. So dear friends, what's very important for us when you do a plan for antenatal care for a woman with diabetes. In preconception, we check by retinal assessment. During pregnancy, retinal assessment can be done at booking and again at the second trimester. And in between, if there is at the first visit, there was any changes or any problem at 16 weeks, we will have another one, right? So this will be three for the problem for the woman with problem. Why? Because there is chances of regression up to 55%. This is very high. So duration of diabetes and high hemoglobin A1C are risk factor for progression of diabetic retinopathy. The risk of developing advanced retinopathy as a result of gestational diabetes only is low. Treatment of proliferative retinopathy, if required, is often with retinal laser photocoagulation, which is safe in pregnancy. Okay, so anybody of you relate to this part from the recent exam question? This part, okay, of the two articles being touched in two. 2023 exam, right? So what is the treatment of proliferative retinopathy if required during pregnancy? Retinal laser photocoagulation. Well done. How about pregnancy related hypertension? Okay, up to 11% of pregnancies in most cases are mild. Severe hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, including severe preeclampsia or eclampsia, may lead to retinal hemorrhage, macular edema, or optic disc swelling, babyledema, in advanced cases. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension. You remember the took article of headache. Okay, so let's see if idiopathic intracranial hypertension is associated with changes in the eye and babyledema or not. What do you think? Yes or no? Yes, yeah, sure. So increased weight gain in pregnancy is a risk factor for the onset of the exacerbation of the idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which can lead to bubble edema. Neuroimaging is required to rule out other conditions, such as venous sinus thrombosis. So remember, guys, in the exam, very important step, don't ever Click the diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension without dear friend, it's without investigations. Right? Investigation result must come as normal because the diagnosis is by exclusion. Pavilledema can occur in so many events, can occur in brain lesion, 
can occur in as you can see pregnancy related hypertension due to the optic disc swelling can occur in thrombotic event in the brain so i can't say that papilledema is diagnostic for idiopathic intracranial hypertension dear friends it's the investigation when it comes free no problem in the investigation by exclusion you can say this is idiopathic intracranial hypertension okay and babilidema is not investigation babilidema is a sign okay so let's have a look to the ocular drugs in pregnancy ocular drugs there is limited data about the use of many drugs in pregnancy the benefit must outweigh the risk of fetus and full discussion with the pregnant woman is encouraged for many uh, topical medications, there is little evidence of harm since systemic absorption is low. But systemic medication should be used with particular caution. Pregnant women should be advised to apply gentle pressure over the lacrimal punctum for two minutes after putting an eye drops to minimize absorption of topical medication. Okay, guys, it's clear so far. Okay, so let's continue our collection of questions okay and the answer of this question the lady had myopia or short sightedness during pregnancy due to water retention in lens a 30 year old woman with history of type 1 diabetes since childhood currently in her first pregnancy at 17 weeks she had poor control of her diabetes and had uh, has had previous laser treatment for proliferative retinopathy Fundoscopy performed at the diabetic antenatal clinic reveals diabetic macular edema. What treatment would you recommend as being safe in pregnancy to treat this condition? What do you think the answer is? Yes, well done. Retinal laser photocoagulation. Right? Okay, so remember it's posterior compartment, usually pathological. Okay. The lady had Retinopathy. What is the treatment of retinopathy? Retinopathy. Retinal laser photocoagulation. It's, yes, it's retinopathy. Okay. So now, if I want to ask you about the macular edema. No, if we say, okay, guys, if we say retinopathy, you will say retinal laser photocoagulation for sure. Okay? If I want to ask about macular edema. It's different. We didn't touch it in the in the, our review now. Okay, so the explanation, my dear, yes, here, that's for the edema, for the macular edema, the explanation will be, or the answer will be, the intravitreal implant of dexamethasone, right? Yes, so this will be the answer for the edema. Okay, so Dr. Monica, she have a question. Okay, so your question, is there any difference in previous and this question? Oh. 
okay so let me clear here my dear friend okay let me be clear here okay you have a lady what is her problem now with retinopathy right if the problem is retinopathy and asking you about what is the safe being safe in pregnancy to treat this condition what is the answer retinal laser photocoagulation clear this is safe right okay next i'd like you to have the next this one is a bit different okay this one is not asking you about the retinal problem this one is asking you about the macular edema and the question about the macular edema not about the proliferative retinopathy so what treatment would you recommend as being safe in pregnancy to treat this condition so now macular edema what answer dexamethasone okay and the injection will be by the intravitreal implant of the dexamethasone so dr monica now is the difference clear okay you are welcome so it's a little bit different and the question makes huge difference in the answer right so be careful in your exam so dear friend okay this is summary of the ocular changes in pregnancy you will find it in the notes okay so regarding the physiological changes and what is the problem of the pathological changes okay so starting from the dry eye uh, sub sometimes diabetic eye disease, okay, and pregnancy-related hypertension, central serous uh, chorioretinopathy, jittery disorders, migraine, or idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Here is the symptoms, how does this problem occur, and referral route, okay, who will see the patient, okay, if the patient have this problem. And in this one, okay, this is, symptom-based approach to man manage ocular pathology okay so for example if the patient presents with unilateral blood vision what will be the management okay or bilateral blood vision without headache or bilateral blood vision with headache this is for you guys if you'd like to know more about the, to the topic okay Okay, moving to another single best answer question, and hopefully that things are running smoothly so far. So what is a single best predictor for postpartum relapse in women with multiple sclerosis? That's from the Tug article of MS in pregnancy. Okay, so relapse during pregnancy or pre-pregnancy relapse rate which one is the correct i can see different answer between c and d so what do you think guys pre-pregnancy condition or something that happened during pregnancy it's actually the correct answer is pre-pregnancy relapse rate Okay, the control before pregnancy. It's like a rule. So guys, I want uh, to tell you about in asthma in pregnancy, what will be the predictor? A patient, a certain patient will have problem or have severe asthmatic changes, worse than asthma in pregnancy. That will be the pre-pregnancy control and pre-pregnancy admission due to asthma, right? Excellent. If we ask you about epilepsy, what will be the most predictable? That because two thirds of patients actually will have no change. So, what will be the predictor of epilepsy control during the pregnancy? That's again the pre-pregnancy. So, it's if the woman did not have any effect in the last nine months or twelve months before the pregnancy. So it's likely that there 
pregnancy will be safe. But if they have fits near to, to the pregnancy, it's likely that they will have problems during their pregnancy and postpartum, right? Clear so far, guys? So it's the pre-pregnancy, okay? So some point about the MS, okay, multiple sclerosis, okay? And what is the problem actually in multiple sclerosis? The problem in the multiple sclerosis, actually, it's the myelin sheath, okay, of healthy nerve. What happened in the myelin sheath? This is um, myelin sheath, as you know, it's a protective membrane that wrap around the axon of the nerve cells, okay, that prevent the, um, you know, the disruption to the nerve. So if the protective layer is damaged or destroyed by inflammation and scarring, like in MS, what will happen to the patient? She will have problem, nerve problem, right? So it's a neurological disease. This neurological disease, guys, that manifests with clinical and subclinical attacks of central nervous system demyelination, women are at least twice as likely as men to develop MS, so more common in women. With mean age of onset 30 years, pregnancy has no adverse long-term effect on the disease progression. That's good, good from our point of view, right? But it's associated with higher relapse rate in immediate postpartum period, okay? So you have a patient with MS. What is the risky period for her? It's a postpartum. MS is not associated with significant uh, obstetric or neonatal compl complications. Women with MS appear to have fewer relapse during pregnancy, but relapse during the first three uh, or four months of postpartum is not uncommon, okay? It happened in 20 to 30% of female patients. So postpartum, they will suffer from the relapse. The single best predictor of postpartum relapse is the pre-pregnancy relapse rate. Okay, guys. The relapse occur less in multiparous women. Okay, so it's highly in the primary. And pregnancy after MS onset is associated with lower risk of progression. A recent systematic review, okay, found that the pregnancy does not alter the risk of MS or long-term progression. Pre-pregnancy counseling and careful planning that will allow women with MS to have a favorable pregnancy outcome. Okay, so the woman should be reassured that the pregnancy does not appear to be harmful overall or maybe beneficial. Okay, guys. So if you have a patient with MS, just be careful of the postpartum relapses. Don't stop the patient medications, okay, if she had any relapse, okay? And breastfeeding will be safe as well. Clear so far? So have let's have another question from the MS to God. Okay. So we have 29-year-old para 2 has been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis presented in labor at 39 weeks of gestation. She has been offered an epidural for pain relief. She asked about the risk of epidural on hair condition. So what do you think? You think that epidural is going to affect the hair condition? Okay, so yes, please reassure your patient, okay, that there is no increased risk of relapse with the use of regional anesthesia, especially epidural use. Okay, so in this table, there's some information about, okay, the outcome of MS in pregnancy. Okay, 
So as you can see, vaginal delivery is safe. Epidural is no problem with the epidural. Okay. For how long is the cumulative risk of type 2 diabetes highest after a pregnancy complicated by gestational diabetes? Okay, so everybody answered three to six after delivery, which is correct. Yes, well done. Well done, my superstars. So 33-year-old had a third baby at 34 weeks of gestation following an induced labor on account of preeclampsia. Her BMI is 29. Otherwise, she's fit and well. Her previous pregnancies were also complicated by preeclampsia. What would be the risk of hypertension in later life? Sixfold, threefold, fivefold, what do you think? Six. Okay. So, dear friend, this is come from a TUG article, okay? Uh, the TUG article called the obstetrician rule in preventing cardio uh, metabolic disease. Okay. So, here is some notes about the uh, risk factor. Okay and the recurrence rate will be sixfold. Okay, just remember the number. Okay, guys, clear? Yeah, epidemiological fact, so we just take the number as it is. Thank you. Okay, which of the following is the nice recommendation for screening after delivery for women affected with gestational diabetes? Yes, this talk article is actually very interesting. They speak about the risk of um, diabetes and hypertension and afterwards after the affection in pregnancy. Okay. Hemoglobin A1C at 6 to 13, do you think so? Do you think the advice is to, first advice is to do hemoglobin A1C or to do first the fasting blood glucose at 6 to 13 weeks? Okay, so here he's not, okay, he, he's not asking you, yeah, about the second line, he's asking you about the recommended thing. So tell me, GTT is not done at six weeks, not random. So you have, you know, guys, you have, don't be tracked, okay? So here you have at six weeks, everybody knows that the recommendation says that we do the screening six to 13, the first screening six to 13, and then we do annual screening by hemoglobin A1C. So. The screening, is it by GTT at six weeks? No, not advised by the guideline. Is it by random glucose or fasting? What do you think? Not random, okay? So is it by hemoglobin A1C as at first recommendation or when the fasting is not possible for any reason? So this one looks like a straightforward Okay, plan for long-term screening, right? 
right guys the annual hemoglobin a1c yes thank you very much so guys what is the immediate effect of electronic cigarette on serum nicotine level from smoking in pregnancy It's rapid rise. Yes, rapid rise. Well, well done. A couple are anxious about the risk of their baby being born with an inherited autosomal recessive condition. This an anxiety stem from the fact that their relative recently had a baby with autosomal recessive condition as well. They want to know what is the most common autosomal recessive condition worldwide. Yes, well done. Okay, this is the sickle cell disease. Okay. Yes, there was a two article that published, I think, two to three years ago, and the answer was thalassemia in one of the two articles. Okay, but guys, please revise the guideline and the recent two article of hemoglobinopathies in pregnancy, and you'll find the sickle cell disease is still the most common worldwide. Thank you. So direct oral anticoagulant medications have the following advantage except. Please tell me. Okay, so it has lower risk of bleeding complication compared to warfarin. No. Okay, so guys, yes, thank you. You have said twice daily dosing may increase chance of patient compliance. It's correct. Okay, so here, guys, some of our summary about the advantage of direct to oral anticoagulant medications. It's rapid onset, rapid offset, no required blood monitoring, and fewer drug supplement and dietary interaction. The disadvantage, it's more expensive, okay, than warfarin. Twice daily dosing that increase the chance of non-compliance. Not all DWAC have FDA approved antidot in case of complication. Potential side effect of direct, direct oral anticoagulant medication. And there is uncontrolled bleeding. This is the most serious side effect. So you can have a single best answer question asking you about what is the most serious side effect. Okay. And this will be the uncontrolled bleeding. Okay. So, however, from the list that given to you guys here, what was, what was, okay, the last list of advantage? except one only was from the disadvantage group, okay, which is A. So yes, well done. Okay, so 30-year-old primary present at 30 weeks of gestation with painful swollen leg, and uh, clinically there was deep vein thrombosis suspected, and she is uh, commented on therapeutic anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin or fragmin, a compression doublex ultrasound is performed and failed to confirm the diagnosis. 
what will be the next step in hair management? Okay, so my, my first question here, guys, I will ask you, okay? Shall we continue or stop anticoagulation? Let me correct that. Continue or stop, what do you think? Okay, so we will stop. Well done, okay. So if I would like to stop, my dear friend, shall I repeat the test or finished? Because there is clinical suspicion of the DVT, so I will repeat the test. When to repeat the scan? You will repeat at day three and seven. Yes, well done. Okay, so the answer, I'm sorry, the previous, yes, this was error and I corrected the error. Okay, so this is discontinue anticoagulation and repeat ultrasound on day three and seven. Well done. Okay. Okay, so this previous collection, guys, or till now, we are discussing um, recent talks, but around the maternal medicine, right? Okay, from now, the questions will have another, you know, collection. So other topics will be coming, okay? So my friends, there is healthy, 45 years old, she's bearish, and she had a total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo of rectomy for heavy menstrual bleeding. She presents to her GP six months after her surgery with vaginal dryness, dyspareunia, and reduced ability to orgasm. What is the most appropriate treatment for her symptoms? Okay, so everybody agree that this is estrogen replacement therapy. Yes, well done. Yeah, it's a fall in estradiol level that results in the uh, vaginal muscle atrophy, guys, and the increased vaginal acidity and discomfort during sex. Um, the systematic HRT alone is not a treatment, so local estrogen is advised. And if you give you, my friend, um, older age, a disabled patient or a patient with cognitive problem that she can't use the um, cream every day. What will be the alternative to cream? An older patient or disabled or patient with cognitive problems? Yes, pessary. Yes, well done, pessary. So estrogen in the form of pessary, yes. Thank you. So my friends, my superstars, a 56-year-old postmenopausal have a cystocyte, stress urinary incontinence, and dyspareunia. What prolapse treatment would you offer to this patient to improve her sexual satisfaction? So she had cystocyte, stress urinary incontinence, and dyspareunia. Colpo suspension. Okay. So look, my dear. If you have a cyst to seal, okay, so this is anterior compartment with a stress urinary incontinence. What is the treatment or what is the thing that we can do, okay, to 
try to find out if this is stress urinary incontinence is de novo, okay, or it's caused by the effect or the pressure from the prolapsed organ. We do investigation in the form of urodynamic. That's good. Okay, so do you know what we can do to make sure or try to find out exactly is the stress urinary incontinence is de novo or from the pressure? We insert the pessary. Yes, excellent. Okay, so pessary in this case can help getting up the cystocele, right? Well done. It can improve, of course, the stress urinary incontinence problem, right? Well done again. Okay, so, so this is regarding the information. Regarding the exam technique. Dr. Nohadi, I know that you are studying very well and you have very clear concepts. However, exam techniques need more focus on the words because, again, we said it's a game of words. So, what prolapse treatment? So, we said before, have to read, 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 okay? The leading sentence in the question. Is a colposan suspension is a prolapse treatment to deal? No, right? So here I would go to choose a prolapse treatment because he asked me about prolapse treatment. Right? Leave so far? Okay. So ring basically is the answer. Twenty-one year old is referred to gynecology clinic with postcoital bleeding. Examination reveal normal cervix. Right? What investigation would you like to perform next? From the postcoital bleeding to article, which is super super important to article. Yes, chlamydia swab. Yes, well done. A 36 year old woman present at 23 weeks of gestation in her first pregnancy with painless vaginal bleeding. Subsequent investigation confirmed diagnosis of stage 1B2 cervical cancer. What treatment should now be offered to this patient? Pregnant. So, from the article of cervical cancer in pregnancy. Okay, so C, A, C, E, okay. C is radical trachelectomy. Are you sure? 23 weeks radical trachelectomy? I don't think so. Okay, so Belfast lymph node dissection. Yes, dear. Any comments? Okay. Okay. So, guys, it's 23 weeks of gestation. This is new adjuvant chemotherapy. Okay. So, I'll I'll just one second guys give me one second just I I will open this to article because it's very important algorithm okay that I would like you to have a look at please okay so revise it please postcoital bleeding as well revise it okay why because it's already hot topics and we can see those hot topics in the exam it makes sense right they like it even before the took article release. So, one second, I'm just please bear with me. Oh, bear with me, please. Okay, oncology. Just I'm opening. Okay, one second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Yes, I cut off. Yes, I agree, dear, with you. Okay. I should have actually put that in my presentation. Excuse me for that delay. Okay, so dear friends, let's have a look uh, on that algorithm. It's worth revising. So dear friends, this is the cervical cancer in pregnancy. Okay, and the management is in the algorithm. The algorithm is very informative. Okay, and here we can see for a lady, who had legion from 1A2, okay, to 1B3. What can we do, okay? So first of all, you need to remember the gestational age of 22 weeks, okay? Because this is the gestational age, okay? This is the youngest gestational age where there is a chance of viability for the fetus, right? However, we will look to the patient. If, the, if this is early pregnancy and 1A2 or 1B1, less than 22 weeks of gestation. So I will have a look or assessment of the pelvic lymph nodes, okay? If there is positive Lymph nodes, I will advise termination of pregnancy so the patient can have her treatment completed. But if it's negative, negative pelvic lymph node dissection, then the patient will have a chance of two things. What is the ST? This is simple trachelectomy, right? Because early stage 1A2 or 1B1, and in the same time, early gestational age, and negative pelvic lymph node dissection. So this is one option. What is the second option? Second option is to delay treatment after treatment. So DTAD, this is delay treatment after delivery. Okay, so this is again for which patient? Less than 22. Okay, so how about if the patient is 22 or above? This is our cutoff. Here, we don't do assessment pelvic lymph node dissection, okay? We will either give her two options. One option is new adjuvant chemotherapy, okay? Or delay treatment till after delivery. So we have either new adjuvant chemo to be given after the 22 or to delay the, the treatment until after delivery. Okay, how about the next stage? Next stage, dear friends, is 1B2. 1B2, if we, before 22 weeks, who is clever and remind me? Who is clever and help me? Okay, Dr. Raba, we will do the pelvic lymph node dissection because we are less than 22. Okay, so dear champion, pelvic lymph node dissection, positive lymph nodes. What is the action? Again, we are below 22 gestation. Termination, well done, Dr. Somai. So go to the other option. What other option is negative lymph nodes? So, what I will do? If negative lymph nodes, give her the options of now either new adjuvant chemotherapy or delay treatment after delivery. Well done. 
Okay. No, gestational age is 22 or more. Looks like our case in the question. Yes, it is. Do I need to do any assessment of lymph nodes? No, no, no. So, action is new adjuvant chemotherapy or to delay treatment after delivery. So clear so far? Okay, so let's have a look now on I, on the station 1B3. In 1B3 and above, okay, we don't have any other option. The option is no matter the gestational age, okay, it's not about the lymph nodes anymore. This is 1B3. It's easier to offer the uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy from the beginning or termination if less than 22 or delay after delivery. This will depend on the woman preferences. Clear so far? Well done. Okay, so I'll take it as a chance from your precious time, if you allow me. Okay, and I'm going to have a look to the algorithm of the investigation and management of postcoital bleeding. Okay, because as I told you, this is one of the most important articles that you need to revise from the recent one. This is a diagnostic pathway for the investigation and the management of postcoital bleeding. Okay. So a woman present with postcoital bleeding, what is the next step? My EMQ champions. Next step is? is history and physical examination. Well done. Okay. Then what investigation to be done? Microbiology swap. The microbiology swap is mainly to rule out what infections, which infection causes postcoital bleeding. Chlamydia, okay, and sometimes Neisseria, okay. So cervical screening tests need to be checked, okay. If the woman is overdue, okay, so we will do a cervical smear at that time. This is a rule in the UK here, that whenever there is a postcoital bleeding or any abnormal bleeding, GB will ask the lady about her cervical smear, or he simply check, right? If the if she is overdue, he must collect the smear at the same time when he does a microbiology smear. Okay, guys? So if it is comes as abnormal results, then the patient will go to the colposcopy, okay? Like the pathway. However, if while examination there was clinically abnormal cervix, what is the management of clinically abnormal cervix? Colposcopy, right? Go to the colposcopy, well done. If there is normal cervix, but persistent postcoital bleeding or coexisting interministral bleeding, in this case, consider the management pathway of heavy menstrual bleeding or post, post, uh, postmenopausal bleeding. Okay, so persistent or coexisting. Then think about HMP or postmenopausal bleeding pathway. Either you will go for TVS and Bapal biopsy if it is postmenopausal, or you will go to the hysteroscopy if she is be be before the menopause. Okay? Clear so far, guys?
Okay, so because I have received two messages from my friends, okay, asking about uh, some TUG articles. This is a course candidate. Okay, so my dear friends, have a look please with me. One second, I'm sorry for the interruption because um, I'm a person, sorry guys, I'm a person who is, in, you know, disrupted easily, very easily. So look, my dear, how to find the, the two articles on the website. Please open the website, homepage, okay, EMRCUG, okay, homepage, go to the EMRCUG talks, okay, click here, EMRCUG talks, and here you will find talks by years, the summaries by years, okay, click on the year, for example, this one, you will find the link, click the link, okay, and then you will find the two articles, okay, so it's by, it's arranged, my dear friends, by year, okay, a weekly so far, Okay, sorry for the interruption, my guest. Okay, because okay, thank you. Okay, so Dr. Sumaya, yes, <laughs> I have my resources, you know. Thank you. Okay, dear. So, guys, so now is it clear so far for the cervical cancer back to the questions okay so what do you think the answer now Yes, well done. I hope that the explanation of answer was clear. Okay, 41-year-old woman present with painless vaginal bleeding at 27 weeks of gestation in her third pregnancy. There was preliminary uh, investigation that to suggest squamous carcinoma of the cervix. What imaging is now indicated to stage this cancer? Very direct and easy question. Yes, so which MRI, please? We have two MRIs. Which one is safe, more safe? The one without contrast. Yes, well done. So MRI without contrast is the answer. 23-year-old woman who presents with long history of dysmenorrhea is undergoing a pelvic magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. What features on MRI is always found in accessory cavitated uterine malformation? So Dr. Noha, I'll just say that it's only used in emergency, life-threatening emergency, okay? Or keep it when the benefit outweighs the risk. So better to be avoided, not absolutely contraindicated. So back to our question here. Okay, guys, for a woman with dysmenorrhea undergoing pelvic MRI, on the MRI, if there is an accessory cavitated uterine malformation, 
So what you will find in her uterus? Normal cavity uterus, okay? Or abnormality in the cavity? This is accessory, it's not septum or... Normal cavity, right? Yes, it's normal cavity. A 35 year old woman has severe dysmenorrhea, ultrasound and MRI confirm diagnosis of accessory cavitated uterine malformation. What treatment is most likely to cure the pain caused by this? management of pain in this patient for accessory okay what do you think we'll give her myrina or progesterone or ocb or sclerotherapy by alcohol or laparoscopic excision yes easy laparoscopic excision well done okay 22-year-old woman presented at 12 weeks of gestation, unable to tolerate diet or fluid. Her body mass index is 17.3. Routine blood tests are as follows. Sodium is higher, 147. Potassium is lower, it's 2.8 hypo. The chloride is 97. Bicarb is 29. Urea is 7. What is the most appropriate immediate investigation? For a patient with low potassium, very low potassium. Yes, comes the role of ECG. Yes, well done. So ECG is indicated when there is very low potassium level this because of risk of cardiac arrhythmia. Yes, well done. According to the WHO, 8% of pregnant women worldwide have inadequate zinc intake. What benefit does zinc supplementation have on pregnancy outcome? This is 2022 took article about preconception health. Anybody is aware? Zinc, zinc. I'm not saying anything like calcium or vitamin D or anything. Zinc is helpful to reduce risk of preterm delivery. Okay. I used to actually um, find a good result with the preconception zinc to the patient, by the way, outside the articles or anything so dear friends again 38 year old multiparous woman present with upper abdominal pain at 33 weeks she had an acute onset of pain radiating through the her back a history of gallstone and cholestasis prior to pregnancy she present with a couple of hours of onset of pain acute pancreatitis is suspected her amylase is four times the upper limit of normal what imaging would be recommended to confirm this diagnosis? When the, uh, when the amylase is so high like this, okay, four times of the upper limit, and you suspect acute pancreatitis, the answer is very easy. Yes, ultrasound scan of the upper abdomen, well done. A 35-old patient present with severe abdominal pain at 22 weeks of gestation, serum amylase is raised, consistent with acute pancreatitis. What do you advise with regard to her nutrition? Nutrition, okay?
Okay, guys, for the patient who is able to eat, can we offer or oral diet and fluids? Or we will keep her MBO? Okay, I'll tell you the end. He told you here nail by, nail by mouse and intravenous fluid. Okay, so believe me, this is a bad, very bad combination for a pregnant woman. If you would like to advise the patient to have nail by mouse, you must offer, offer this patient, okay, a parenteral nutrition, not intravenous fluid. Can anybody live on intravenous fluid? Keep hair on intravenous fluid. No, okay, so this combination is not correct. Before we go to the parenteral nutrition, we must try oral diet and fluid if the patient is able to do. Okay. Okay, one lovely question, okay, about the ulipristal acetate. A 25-year-old woman had a normal delivery at term four months ago. She's exclusively breastfeeding and had an episode of unprotected sexual intercourse. She takes ulipristal acetate for emergency contraception. So he's not here asking you for a choice. She already received it. Okay. What breastfeeding advice would you give her? That's 2021 took article about breastfeeding and drugs, which I will advise all of you, please guys revise this, you know, uh, safety check of the drugs. So the advice to express and discard the breast milk for seven days before, after, sorry, use, right? After her dose. Thirty-four year old woman had an emergency cesarean section at thirty-eight weeks of gestation for fetal bradycardia in her first stage of labor. She had a history of type one diabetes and was induced for reducing insulin re requirement. She was admitted on day four post delivery with signs of wound infection. Wound swab had a grow of mesocellin resistant staphylococcus aureus. What antibiotic would you recommend for this patient who is breastfeeding? Okay, so everybody answered correctly. Well done, my superstar, the stick of planning. Yes. A 50-year-old woman is referred with vaginal bleeding 18 months after her last menstrual period. She had two adult children and worked as a personal trainer. Her body mass index is 24. She is non-smoker with no family history of notes. And her pelvic exam is unremarkable except for slight vaginal bleeding. Transvaginal ultrasound revealed endometrial thickness of six, but no irregularity or polyp seen. An endometrial biopsy is taken, but the sample is inadequate. When you call her to inform her of the result, she says that bleeding has stopped. What is the next stage, uh, stage you would recommend for this patient management?
Okay, so you all okay, you all agree that if she is having inadequate sample, that means atrophic changes. Do you think that this lady is high risk or low risk? He gave you so many information just to show you about her risk, background risk. Okay, so the patient is low risk. So would you agree just to send her home? Okay. Yes, he had a, he had endometrial biopsy there already done. Okay, thank you. Okay, so 50, 55 year old attend one stop clinic with postmenopausal bleeding. She is fit. Okay. One second, my dear friends. Okay, so thank you for reading the case. 55 year old woman attend the one stop clinic with postmenopausal bleeding. She's fit and well and body mass index of 32. She had five days of heavy bleeding about six weeks previously. She had heavy bleeding. Examination unremarkable. Transvaginal ultrasound revealed in the middle seconds of seven with no obvious polyp. Endometrial biopsy showed no evidence of hyperplasia, atypia, or malignant changes. She is relieved to receive the result though, uh, though she does still have occasional spotting. What management option would you recommend for this patient next? Okay, so everybody agree that this patient is high risk now. Right? Yes. So, yes, correct. So I would agree that I will hysteroscopy is required for this patient. Yes, correct. 49 year old scheduled for total laparoscopic hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo of rectum. For severe menorrhagia resistant to medical treatment, there are no known drug allergy. What antibiotic prophylaxis is required? no drug allergy so you you all agree to give her cefirexine and metronidazole okay guys we usually use the one dose prophylaxis from which group of antibiotic The kevlosporin, right? So you will start by earlier generation, okay? Nobody go to the third or fourth generation, please, okay? Okay, so 
from the given medication, which one fit into this description? Can be given IV and Okay, so you you want Dr. Aisha, you want to give ciprofloxacin with cefazoline? I don't think. I don't think, right? So it's cefurexime and metronidazole. Okay. Okay. So what you need to read really now. Okay, so if you advise me about recommended reading now, what I will advise. I would advise you guys to read drug, okay? The safety of drug and breastfeeding, okay? That's very important to the article, right? And it's from the 2021 collection. This is one. Another one that you need to read for the medication is a TUG article, okay? It's about um, evidence-based perioperative management, okay? And enhanced recovery in benign gynecological laparoscopy, okay? And there is another TUG article about prevention of infection why you need to read this TUG article because it's full of medication information okay whenever there is a drug safety information it's very important for you in practice and in exam because your exam is so near so focus on the practice please clear focus on that exam okay question practice exam question and the relevant information. I can't just answer based on my experience or my based on my hospital protocol. Yes, Dr. Amal, I agree that not only the last exam had lots of questions on antibiotics, it's all exams. Whenever antibiotic is there, it will be a site of exam question, believe me, okay? So they still bring questions from the group B streptococcus antibiotic, okay? Uh, choices especially with allergies they and it, it's you know like a, it's a guideline that's released like six years or maybe ago but still important okay also they bring it from the prevention and treatment or management of sepsis okay guideline they bring from the TUG articles three TUG articles published around 2021 regarding drugs okay safety of medication and breastfeeding is super important for the college. Okay, the perioperative management in laparoscopic or benign uh, gynecological surgery is important. Okay, and prevention of infection. Okay, the thing, Dr. Amal, here is that you need to to have some effort and read the TUG article, please, because the TUG article summary it has a highlighted point and it has some advices for choice. Okay, of the medication, so you will be able to choose an exam. Okay. The question number eighteen, because we are about to finish, guys. B or plus C, what? Here is cefirexime and metronidazole, okay? Here is 49-year-old woman is scheduled for total laparoscopic hysterectomy and bilateral salvingeophorectomy for endometriosis resistant to medical treatment. What preoperative busting advice would you recommend? Again, evidence-based preoperative management and enhanced recovery in benign gynecological laparoscopy. This is a TUG article and this information about advice that you will give to the patient. No food, no solid food for how many hours? 
six, okay, and clear fluids up to two hours preoperatively. Yes, well done. Okay, so a 52 year old woman is scheduled for total abdominal hysterectomy and bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy for stage 1A1 endometrial cancer. In order to reduce her risk of surgical site infection, this is the CERTOG article I'm speaking about. So what you would recommend in regard to preoperative pubic hair removal to reduce risk of infection. The lady will have abdominal hysterectomy, okay? So do you think that this lady need pubic hair removal? No, right? So no hair removal is required for abdominal hysterectomy. Twenty-three year old. This will be our last question in discussion today. Okay, and I promise that I will ask the group moderator, okay, Dr. Madenji, that she will post the rest of the question in this file for you guys as a quiz, okay, for discussion. So, a 23-year-old woman is having planned elective cesarean section at 39 weeks of gestation for breech presentation. She's fit and well with no known drug allergies. What antibiotic treatment would you recommend to reduce her risk of post-operative endometritis? So, dear friends, which medication from these can be given? Dr. Noha Dia, read carefully the last three years took articles, okay? I can't predict which one is important for the exam, but hot topics are hot. Important topic in practice equal important topic in exam, okay? That's very simple advice. However, they still bring questions from any took article. So please read it, okay? This is one thing, quick revision. You will find that most of the information are easy to digest. Some points that need to revise, like algorithm, like table, like drug recommendation or safety, those things are knowledge-based. So you have to just revise it, okay? So in order not to mix in the exam. Questions tend to appear in a single best answer, okay? Older TUG article, you will find it in the ministry of the course, okay? So in every module we have discussed, important, relevant TUG articles is covered, okay? So here is the answer, cefiraxime, right? I'm not going to give ceftriaxone as prophylaxis. I'm not going to give augmentin in cesarean section, erythromycin also not, and gentamicin, of course. So the suitable medication is the cefiraxime, 30 minutes pre-operative. And actually, the advice in the NICE guideline is within 60 minutes, but this is the nearest one here, or this is the most correct one here. Okay, guys. Are we clear so far? Okay. So, dear friends, please, utilize the remaining days very well, okay? Very effectively. So, this session, I'm trying to highlight the important TUG article or the important recent questions uh, on the TUG articles, okay? Still, there is a lot, of course, to cover. Um, so I will advise you, really, that you have a look to the last three years, okay? And be, be my guest, okay? Till your exam, you will find access to the summaries, okay? But for my course candidate, guys, after the huge effort that we have made during the course, Okay, please go to the question bank, solve the question in the question bank, okay? And I'll, I'll post this file as well for you guys to revise, okay? Look to the summaries, and whenever we have discussed an important TUG article 
in our um, preparation and revision, please be careful, okay? It will come in the exam. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Wish you all the best, okay? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, bye.